Hi friends and welcome to this episode of the Ian Khan Show. You're listening to an Aftershock special episode and I'm speaking with a co-contributor to the recent book Aftershock. Today I'm speaking with Hannah Sapiens who's a biohacker and human augmentation technologist committed to the idea of radically improving the human condition. He's an author, speaker, professional advisor on the impact of exponential technologies and he's also a faculty member at Singularity University Nordic. Let's speak with Hannes. Hannes, welcome to the Ian Khan Show. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have with me Hannes Sepiens. He's based out of Stockholm, works for Singularity University, and he and I are the contributors to Aftershock. It's the book put together by a friend, John Schroeder, and um, a book that came out 50 years after Alvin Toffler wrote the book, Future Shock. 50 years ago. It's so long ago. It, how do we even make sense of what he wrote back then is what we're going to talk about right now. How are you, Hannes? I'm very well, thank you. And it's, it's great to be on here with you. Thank you so much for making time. I know you're in Stockholm, so give us a COVID-19 impact assessment as to what's happening in Stockholm. Right. Well, frankly, I think life here is relatively close to normal compared to many other places. We haven't really had a proper lockdown. The kids still go to school. Obviously, a lot of people work from home. I do that myself. But I'm happy to tell you that life is is carrying on relatively normal over here. So Sweden right now, obviously, is one of those countries that is defying conventional norms. It's defying what everybody's talking about, lockdowns, shut down everything, don't move, don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But I think the world is failing to understand what Sweden is doing and why it's doing it. And many Mm. people are afraid that is it the right thing to do? What's the strategy behind keeping everything open? What are Swedes doing to stay safe, generally speaking? Right. So this this could potentially be a long conversation, but my main takeaways for an international audience would be that the Swedish strategy is that the cure shouldn't be worse than the initial disease. So yes, COVID-19 is a terrible disease, but... If we run the country into a complete economic crash, then uh, that's going to have even worse consequences. And uh, full quarantine works for a short time, but it has also has many negative effects for society. I think the explanation why this is happening in Sweden is partly the way this country works and partly it's the culture of Swedes. Uh, So uh, the first dimension is that in Sweden, the politicians have stepped back from, from making decisions and left it to the experts. Whereas in many other places, we've seen politicians who want to be brave and they want to make decisions and they want to show that they take it seriously and they lock everything down and close the borders. And and that's not very sustainable if this is going to last for for many, many months. Yes. Second dimension is that we Swedes have a general overall, we obey authority (laughs) to, to a decent extent. So if the government tells us, stay at home, don't meet your grandparents, people actually comply to a very large extent without, you know, the threat of putting police and military in the street to enforce these things. Excellent. Well, hoping everybody comes out of this without a scratch. Let's talk about Toffler. Toffler has changed the way many of us think. Um, Aftershock got 50 plus futurists together and we all wrote our piece in the book talking about what does future shock mean? What are we doing today? You've written that you constantly are, are trying to explain future shock to people or you're trying to put them into future shock so that they could start understanding the changes the world is going through and so on. Tell me about your process of knowing future shock and then helping others understand it. Right. Yes, I read the book uh, many years ago and I found it very inspirational. So it's been a concept I've carried with me for many years. And one thing that I have been doing a lot over the last few years is that I have been very active in the world of biohacking where we experiment with uh, new technologies and what we can do to modify biological systems everywhere from cells to plants to animals, even to homo sapiens. And in this role, I have been traveling the world, really speaking to audiences and doing workshops with companies and organizations. And I, as a practical biohacker, I really enjoy uh, taking people through an experience before I do the theory part. And uh, one of the many hacks that we apply is, is to chip implant people on stage. And chip implants is an awesome way to uh, uh, experience how technology is not just modifying society and business, but also ourselves. And 
I find the reactions to, instead of showing people some beautiful slides and curves, when you actually take them through a live demo when there is blood and there is needles and there is drama, that touches very deeply and it conveys a, a very strong message. And when I think of this in terms of giving people a proper future shock. <laughs> and so you're putting future shock into actual perspective by, by getting people to interact with technology in the way they always listen, but then you're getting them to experience that. I think that's a great way of getting people to, to understand something is by going through the process, the pain, the pleasure, whatever that we can call it. In the book, you also talk about the ideas of big brother, big sister. We're always talking about surveillance states, how the world is changing, how we're being watched and how some people always want to know what you're doing and how they use our information to do whatever they need to do. And there's so many different ideas, thoughts, people who have different ways of thinking about it. How do you separate these? Tell us about your philosophy on this. Right. Well, in a nutshell, we live in a world which is already a world of distributed sensors and big data and enormous data flows. This is the new normal. It's, it's not going to, to go away. And you can take different perspectives on this. The obvious one, let's say the 20th century perspective would be, oh no, this is a big brother society. We are being under surveillance. We are being you know, abused and the data is being taken uh, of our behavior and then it's being used against us in different ways. And it's overall a, a frightening uh, you know, idea of the future. What I'm trying to convey and with the metaphor of the big sister society is that if we take this world of big data and consciously design how we want these things to work with respect for the individual user and also giving the user control and power over their own data, uh, then we can enable a very different society. And with the metaphor of the big sister society, what I want to convey is a world where it is not a, a big brother bully that sort of observes you and addresses you in, in ways that frighten you, but a caring system watched over by machines of loving grace is a classic uh, line from a, a good old poem. Uh, and what I'm trying to say with the big sister society is that we can create a society in which the systems take care of us to a very great extent. But then there's, of course, the, the ironic twist that I myself grew up with two big brothers and I never had a big sister. So maybe I see them in a, in a somewhat rose tinted light. Yeah. And you write about this in the book and I'm going to read from, uh, from actually from the book. You say big sister does not spy on us. She protects us from prying eavesdroppers. Big Sister does not monitor our online habits in order to push more products on us. Instead, she negotiates with uh, the other superbly powerful systems on the other side on our behalf. And I want to add a thought here that I really believe we are going through this very initial evolution of our relationship with technology, right? Our relationship with surveillance, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, name it, whatever it is. We're I don't think we've lived with all these things for many, many years. And I think this primary relation that we have, many things we are too keen on, many things we don't observe. I'm wondering, and it's an open question, I wonder what the world will be like 20 years from now or 30 years from now, right? And I'm thinking about Toffler. 50 years mm -hmm. ago, he wrote the book. Mm -hmm. What will the world be 25 years from now? Will we really be so attached to our data and our mm -hmm. information? that we are as we are right now, or would we have evolved to a different state and we wouldn't care about something? What, what do you think about that? I think there are data that we still don't have access to that are tremendously important. For example, data relating to our own health. Today, if I feel uh, ill for some reason, uh, I need to go to a doctor, I need to draw a blood sample, we need to analyze it in a lab, and then I'll get my data a week later. And this, for me, the body as a system is something that we urgently need to, to have a completely different data access to. And in 20 years from today, I think that will absolutely be the norm. I think that what we need is a technology that gives us a real-time understanding of what is happening in our systems. We can do this for companies. We can create awesome companies with dashboards of uh, web traffic or cash or inventory flows. But we can't do it for the most important system of all, the ones that keeps us alive. And my vision is that we must create this uh, technology that allow us this access to our bodies. And I would like to make the analog with vaccinations because 
100 years ago, most people were not vaccinated and many people died from diseases like tuberculosis. And today, it's of course the norm. Everyone has numerous vaccinations during the years when we grow up and we don't question it. My view is that in 20 years from now, people will be asking, how did people survive back then when you didn't have this real-time understanding of what was going on in your bodies? And you know what we'll tell them? We're going to say, yeah, can you imagine? People died back then. Yeah, I completely agree with you and that we are going through this natural process of rejecting something new and fighting it and opposing it, but then we are getting very comfortable with it. One of the dilemmas with technology generally doing so much for us is um, is privacy, is the integrity of information. I, I think at the end, I could be wrong, but if you simmer down everything, people are either afraid of their body, they, that they will be caused bodily harm if, if their information is exposed. So let's say my information is exposed and I might say, well, a stalker will come to my home and attack me or rob me, correct? Like literally the bottom line. Or people might say, well, somebody's going to steal all my money from my bank. Remember the early days when online banking started, people wouldn't even log into online banks mm -hmm. saying, no, I don't trust this thing. Mm -hmm. Because why? Well, somebody may access my funds and take my money. So these are literally big, big things that people are afraid of. And my question to everybody all the time is, what if they, they have our information and they cannot do anything, right? Mm. You see a lot happening with the democratization of technology and how mm. data is everywhere. Maybe tomorrow it would be fine to give our data away mm. and we wouldn't be afraid that any harm mm. will come to us, financial, economic, mm. bodily harm. One of the things now that I want to get into regarding biohacking is that sure, we're going to have implants, we're going to maybe, and that's where we're going with biohacking, correct? What if the corporation that controls these implants starts controlling me and does something to me, makes me into a slave, a robot? I don't know. People have great imagination. They can it's easy to, to make the worst. Right? So how do we start creating that understanding what the possibilities mm. are? What, what are your thoughts on this mm. as, you, as you do this work in, in biohacking? I think we've overcome bigger challenges. Uh, I think that this is, in many ways, it's a perspective of, of human rights. It's not the data in itself that is bad in any way. Uh, we need to understand if we specifically take body data, for example, it's always an agent with a certain agenda that has the potential to abuse it. And in open societies and in well-working societies, we have protections against these things. And this is what we must extend to all human beings on this planet. Uh, the principles of privacy, of human rights in a broad sense. There are also initiatives, of course, regarding understanding the rights for upgraded persons, such as, for example, the right to have ownership to techno third party technology in your body, the right to imagine that I would have at some point an implant from Apple, for example. At any point in time, I will have the right to, if they want to take it away, I will have the right to keep it. If it's part of me, I will be able to say yes or no to any kind of software systems that are installed there. We can set up rules and procedures that actually protect the individual to a significant extent with technology and also the legal systems that we have in place today. So I am an optimist that we will mull through with creating this more benevolent surveillance system, which I call the big sister. Do you see some regions, some countries are doing some really good work uh, regarding this? I know a lot of mm. places and regions are doing work about it, mm. but good work. What are some of the good examples that you can share with us? Well, let me be honest with you. Uh, I am proud and I'm also happy to be living in Europe in this day and age because of the way data is treated here. If you somewhat simplify uh, the different world systems and how we, we work with data, you, can, you have the American model, which is that uh, individuals' users' data are the property of the corporations. It can be collected, it can be sold, it can be traded, and it can be exploited in, in many ways. And then you have the, the Chinese version, which is data not for profit, but data for control when it's the state that collects the data on the people. Companies are relatively re restricted, but the government can apply the insights on people's behavior and sanction different behaviors. Whereas in the European model, we do our best, far from perfect, to protect individual rights and human freedoms under the law. And I think 
for example, with the GDPR, we have a decent degree of protection. It's interesting to see, though, how other parts of the world, how this is playing out, because we can see that countries with more authoritarian tendencies, such as Russia and, and Turkey, they are looking very closely at the Chinese model. So we'll really see, I, I see this as a battle of, of really some different systems in the 21st century, how we, how we manage these big data models on a national and international level. I also think that I completely agree. I also think we've got to do a lot of work when it comes to regulations, when it comes to international relationships, when it comes to a framework that we can apply to this or subset of technologies globally, right? Because if I have data implants, uh, if I have implants of some kind in me, you know, I've got different things happening. And I go from US to I go to Japan or I go mm. to India or I go to China. Mm. And I should have the same rights or, you know, the governance around having those implants. And so that's very important, I think, that a global framework be created. Is there somebody who's leading this or is there somebody who's creating this framework? Is there a body, an organization that's working on this right now or no? Not to my knowledge. There is no... uh international initiative on a significant level. There are brilliant technologists and philosophers who are exploring these concepts. I think that they may not be as influential as we want them to be, but COVID-19 is, of course, a roadblock now in terms of the ongoing globalization. But I think that globalization and international harmonization of laws, of travel, of industry, of business is just is going to pick up again sooner or later. It's an inevitable development. And of course, we need to harmonize these things. Otherwise, people will vote with their feet and uh, go to places where they feel that they are treated fairly. Absolutely. Hoping that the next five to 10 years, we'll see more development in the world of biohacking. Help us maybe take, you know, the first few steps into biohacking. What should our listeners do about it? Where can they go and read more about it? Or what can they do? I'm not saying they should start experimenting on their bodies with something, but what is a safe way? Well, they should. What is a safe way? Which is my Right. Question. So there are many good things in which you can explore just getting to understand your... So let me explain briefly the concept of biohacking specifically for us humans. What we can do is you can measure, thanks to new technologies, a lot of things about your body. Through wearables and other systems, you can log and, and understand your system in, in many good ways. Then the hacking comes in. First, you need to understand the system. Then you need to see how you can modify it. If you want to change your vital parameters in various ways, your cholesterol or different vitamin levels, etc., you can address that through uh, diet and exercise and supplements, etc. So, but I would encourage everyone to, for example, do a DNA test. Get an understanding of your own genome. Don't do the silly ones like, oh, what's my heritage? That's not what this is all about. (laughs) It's about understanding how your system works, what kind of diseases you're susceptible to, what kind of diet and exercise that are actually optimal for you based on your genetics. And in this perspective, I think that everyone should really do a, a genetic test because you will learn a lot of interesting things. A rapidly expanding field in genetics is pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics is the fact that your genes, in fact, have a great effect on different medicines that you take. And a lot of people take medicines that don't really have the expected effect because they have certain gene variants. A lot of doctors subscribe certain medicines without being aware of whether the patient has that particular gene or not. And if you go to the FDA website, they are have an ever-growing list of gene markers that now relate to different medications. So this is a completely new field in research that has just exploded over the last few years, simply because we now have access to huge human genome data sets. And I encourage everyone to learn about this technology, what you can do with it, and how it really impacts your life in very important ways. Uh, you mentioned the DNA test. Is there a specific test that's, that people should take? Like there's, there's probably many of them. But... There are hundreds online. You, you can just browse around. Yeah. Uh, now, if you're concerned about how they use your data, uh, I wouldn't go for a US-based one, so forgive me, but uh, I'd rather go for a European-based one where you actually own the data, even if it's in the company system. And there are dozens of them online. And so the reasons for doing a, a genetic test is learn about disease, learn about how you should eat and exercise, and most importantly, perhaps, learn about what kind of medications you may or may not be suited to taking. And then it's the more uh, cute and little bit silly dimension, which is, oh, what kind of ancestry do I have? And find uh, distant relatives. Uh, That's not for the biohackers. Absolutely. 
Well, I think that that's an interesting thought for us to go, go and figure out who we are, first of all, and then get into the second stage of optimizing our body, look into biohacking, see what, what can enhance our lives, our health. Uh, you never know what's, what's around the corner. Hannes, where can people find out more about you? Where can they follow you? Check out your work. Tell us. Right. So I'm on most of the social platforms. If they want to find me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, it's Hannes Sapiens. And I'm very happy to engage with uh, people who are human augmentation and human body modification will give us radically different and better future. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Hannes, for being here, having this conversation with us. Thank you for being part of Aftershock. It's been incredible sharing the platform with thinkers like yourself. Very humbling for me to be part of that special group of people. Keep doing what you're doing, continue making changes in the world, and hopefully we'll see you around the bend after COVID-19. And I completely agree the world is going to bounce back. Things are going to change and hopefully we'll be stronger, better. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to catching up with you uh, very shortly. My pleasure, Ryan. Thank you very much for Thanks our time. You, much. you take care. Take care. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com. 